one more minute and then we're just gonna start to take uh, the pulse of the room, why people are here, what you wanna talk about today around feminist movements and feminist leadership um, in 2021 with the impact of COVID-19 really on all of our minds. So let me share my screen. And what we're gonna do is put uh, your thoughts into the Mentimeter. If you can go to www.menti.com and use the code 48105784, that's 48105784, and answer this question, what excites you about feminist movements? Okay, go to www.mentimeter.com and use the code 4810-5784. Awesome, progress. If you're just joining us, please feel free to put your name and your affiliation if you want to in the chat. Uh, change your pronouns if you want um and let us know that you're here if you go to www.menti.com and use the code 48105784 you can contribute to our taking the pulse what excites you about feminist movements today intersection my name is paul mugambi from kenya i'm a blind person i cannot be able to chat right away but i'll say I'm a blind person from Kenya. Thanks for joining, Paul. Great to have you here. Paul Mogam. Thanks for letting us know. We've got some things on the Mentimeter. What it cites people about feminist movements, empowerment, equality, opportunity, intersectionality, community, transnational collaboration, Change makers, progress, hope, bridging differences. I like that one. Now is the moment. Wow, empowerment really plays a strong role right there in the center. Sisterhood. Awesome. Thank you all for joining. And we're just taking a, the pulse of the room. As more people join us, please feel free to put your name and your affiliation in the chat. Make sure you have your pronouns. If we're gonna shout out to you and go to www.menti.com and use the code 4810-5784 to tell us what excites you about feminist movements today. Solidarity, great, that's popping up mutual support, transformation, collective intelligence. Love it. Power, awareness, awesome. Opportunity, girls leadership, Equality, change is coming, inclusion. If you're just joining us, please feel free to go to www.menti.com and use the code 48105784 and let us know how you're feeling, what's exciting you about feminist movements today. Community, support. Also feel free to put your name and your affiliation in the chat. We're just gonna give a few more moments to let everybody come in, settle down for this conversation circle on feminist movements and leadership in the time of COVID-19, it's 2021. 
where are we as a feminist movement? We're gonna talk about that today. So welcome. Awareness, equity, collaboration. Love it. Social justice. All right. I think we have a sense of the moment. Thank you all for being a part of the process. And welcome again. So we're at 4.05 and glad that everybody's joining, putting their names and affiliation in the chat. Great to see you all. We don't have time for everyone. We're at 124 people to introduce ourselves, um, but we will have breakout groups later. Just so you know, you'll have an opportunity to discuss in smaller groups as a part of this conversation. Circle, welcome again. My name is Shelley Inglis and I'm executive director of a human rights center at the University of Dayton in the US. Um, and I'm joined by my co-facilitator, Ani, who's gonna share her screen as we start to talk about um, feminist movements and leadership in the time of COVID-19. Just to give you a little sense of how this is gonna work, we are going to show a um, PowerPoint presentation and have a group discussion in this large group format. Um, then we will show you a video and ask you some prompts, discuss a little bit what women's participation and leadership and feminist movements mean. Um, and then we will break out into groups. And after we come back from groups, we will report back on what we've been discussing, what our key takeaways are, and we'll have a poll and then we'll finish up at 5.30. So stay with us and uh, it's great to have everybody here. Thank you so much for being a part of the conversation. Ani, do you wanna share the screen? Yep, Shelly, thank you so much. Just quickly wanted to say welcome and it wasn't a really exciting start and I see a lot of different countries in the chat, which makes me super happy. Um, as Shelly mentioned, Ani will be co-facilitating with Dr. Shelly. I'm a member of uh, the Armenian International Women's Association and have worked with NGO CSW with their advocacy research group and young, young leaders and young professionals group um, for the Commission the Status of Women 65. So it's been an amazing journey. And what I will do, I will share my screen and then we're gonna start the discussion as as Shelly mentioned. Um, so here you go. Everyone should be able to see my screen. Shelly, you wanna, you wanna start? Yeah, so as you know, as we said, this is part of the conversation circles, which the NGO forum is putting together at CSW 65. We're so excited for you to be here. And our topic today is feminist movements and leadership in the time of COVID-19. I personally think our topic is great because it is so linked to what we are seeing today. And the COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, has done extraordinary things, um, both in terms of uh, emphasizing our uh, transnational global solidarity and the impacts um, that a pandemic can bring on all of us. It's also had really devastating uh, impact on women and girls in particular in all parts of life from economic and livelihood questions to access to education, to setting girls and their participation back to having women lose jobs and um, to having a substantial impact on, in particular, women of color, uh, indigenous and uh, black and brown communities. Um, we've had an extraordinary amount of positive uh, news in terms of women's leadership though in the COVID-19 pandemic, the countries that are emerging uh, as leaders in managing the pandemic are notably women-led um, with strong women's participation in 
in their leadership positions. We've also had an extraordinary upsurge of uh, social movements, in particular feminist uh, inform and intersectional movements around the issues of decreasing civil society space, uh, increasing autocracy, um, increased restrictions on people's freedoms, the decline in democracy and structural injustice and racism across the globe. So it's an extraordinary time. And I want, I want to just mention all of these things. There's a lot wrapped up in the subject matter today. So we have feminist movements um, and the waves of feminist movements that we all know and we've all been a part of, um, as well as women's movements. They're not always the same thing, um, but all of us here have been a part of a feminist or women's movement. We're talking about women's leadership participation of women in all aspects of uh, life and in all institutions, from government participation at the highest levels, but also within the corporate and, and economic spheres. We have increasingly women economists at the top of global financial institutions and women economists who are really taking at the forefront, taking on global capitalism and the negative impact of transnational um, hypercapitalist space. We're talking about women's participation, which has been at the core of the women's movement um, and at the core of um, our goals in terms of ensuring that women not only equally participate um, in all areas of institutions and in all areas of life, but also that women's issues, women's concerns, women's values, um, the the uh, priority urgent issues that women believe impact not only them, but their society, that those issues are put at the forefront of decision making. So I want to open it up and hear from you. What are the issues that are you are facing? What are you thinking about feminist movements today, women's leadership and participation? What comes to mind? You can start by entering your ideas in the chat, but I also uh, you know welcome. We're almost at 200 people, but for you to raise your voice and put forward what your thinking is. Another of the huge issues that um, we are facing, obviously, as COVID has set many communities into homes, those who have homes and privileged enough to have secure spaces, but the global gaps in technology and infrastructure, the lack of access to resources, I just want to recognize and technology and infrastructure that we're all so privileged to be here today on Zoom and to be together sharing this space. Um, so tell me, what is tremendous pressure for my community to not be a feminist? Um, that's, that's a difficult um, discussion point. There is a tremendous backlash that we are all experiencing backlash against multilateralism and a backlash against transnational feminism, a, gap, a backlash against the many of uh, the achievements that the women's movement have seen in terms of women's reproductive rights and other areas. And we're facing backlashes in our communities in terms of xenophobic, racist, um, uh, and other discriminatory dimensions within communities, women's economic power and discrimination. Thank you, Amanda. Anyone else, other ideas? What are you facing in terms of feminist movements? What's getting you disgusted, excited? Violence against women. Violence against women is the second pandemic and it is increased as women have been asked to stay at home and remain at home, we become more and more vulnerable to violence um, without having access to services and having access to protection. Violence against women continues to be a major challenge. I just saw funds. Um, thank you somebody for raising the issues around fundraising. How do we fund feminist movements? How do we access the resources um, to ensure that women can participate 
takes a lot of resources to run for election, to be able to participate in public life, to be able to run civil society organizations, employ other women and feminists. What is the challenge? We have a huge challenge in terms of accessing the resources um, that we need, particularly when those resources are not controlled by women. We've also had a tremendous um, generational shift in understanding of who is valued in society and what kind of work is valued in society with the COVID-19 pandemic. It has put frontline workers front and center in our understanding of who's contributing and who takes on the risks in ensuring society, a globalized society continues. Uh, the majority of those workers are um, people of color. Women play a huge role in providing most of that frontline work. Um, their struggles, their putting self-sacrifice has been at the forefront of these discussions. Mental health. If there was ever a time where the issues of mental health become clear, it's a, a time of huge stress um, and ongoing trauma for communities that has happened with COVID-19. It's a huge amount of concern around mental health for not only adults and caretakers, but the mental health of children and girls, those who have not been able to access school and go to school, engage with other friends and students, putting a lot of strains on the family environment. I see family education, substance abuse, access to good food. All right, sorry to interrupt, but are you able to turn on closed captioning for this? We should be able to. A good question. We'll ask our admin. Deva, maybe you can look into this and see if we're able to do it. Yep, I'm looking into this right now. I also wanna mention that we are recording this for anybody, um, for you all to be aware of that. And it's live on YouTube. Just to keep that in mind as you um, express yourselves and make appropriate choices about what you wanna share. Uh, while you're looking at the chat, one thing I also wanted to share, um, Shelly, is how, and this is one of the themes of our um, call, co feminist movements and women um, participation in COVID-19. One thing that the pandemic exposed is how the current structures disproportionately and adversely impact women and how COVID-19 you know, increased some of the violence against women and domestic violence. So I think, um, and, and I saw women in my life being adversely affected, uh, healthcare workers, nannies and babysitters, women who have, um, and don't have nine to five jobs being affected. Um, so this is something that popped into my mind because of my personal experiences. And of course the data shows that as well. So I wanted to share that too. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Ani. I'm seeing a, a lot of discussion around violence and lack of access to abortion services, um, violence against women human rights defenders. Some interesting comments in the chat around the different types of issues um, that women are facing in different communities and different countries around the world. You could identify where you're facing this challenge. Um, primary caregivers, frontline workers more susceptible to COVID. A lot of the questions around women's participation in decision-making you know, predated 
COVID-19 obviously continues to be even more of a challenge in light of the extra burdens and the time poverty that women face. Gender mainstreaming and quotas in government institutions, affirmative action policies have been one of the key ways traditionally that the women's movement has sought to address and ensure redress for prior discrimination to ensure women's participation. While we've had a lot of progress on, on quotas and affirmative action, we don't have enough. They don't stretch enough across institutions um, and both vertically across institutions and society within corporate and business, but also horizontal, horizontally in governance institution, women's participation at the local level is becoming a really important dimension. There continue to be significant barriers to affirmative action for women at all levels of decision-making. Getting help for the elderly. There have been those who are particularly at risk in the pandemic, um, people of color in particular, elderly, those with pre-existing health conditions. This has been a big challenge in terms of being able to ensure um, that those who are most vulnerable are getting the resources and the support that they need, um, even with those who are losing um, and have lost loved ones to COVID-19, at least in, in the country that I currently am, am in, the lack of access to be able to grieve and mourn in normal ways, to be able to grieve and mourn loss with others, um, to be able to reach across family um, and grieve together has been a significant trauma of the COVID-19 pandemic. Lack of funding and organized systems for reproductive rights. Women from minority groups being overlooked in, for leadership positions. How can we ampli amplify our voices and goals to confront and weaken the forces that dilute agreed conclusions? This is definitely one of the biggest challenges that we're discussing here in CSW. So the progress that we've made and the kind of backlash and regression we're seeing on women's rights and gender equality, the emphasis we need on um, holding governments and powerful players to account, being able to ensure accountability, one of the big challenges that we face. Customs and religions that are discriminatory and result in torture, inhuman and degrading treatment of women. Thank you for identifying indigenous women in the United States, one of the communities most impacted has definitely been indigenous communities. Access to safe and healthy abortion services and reproductive rights, huge burdens on women holding together the home, the work, the families and teaching our girls the impact on the girl child. It's been extraordinary. What will the long-term impacts be for girls, particularly in communities where girls have now been diverted away from education into early marriage, into forms of labor and work it will be very difficult to revert back in schools, social norms affecting young girls' opportunities. The role of technology, technology being a major cutting at knife's edge. There are some very positives about technology um, that we'd be able to experience and share and be together like we are today the very negative role that technology can play in promoting stereotypes. 
<laughs> the misinformation and disinformation on gender equality. The exclusion of trans people from feminist discussions and language. Being able to share this knowledge around the world. We're coming from all over here. If anybody would like to speak out, I welcome that. In rural areas in India, frontline healthcare workers, great risks to themselves and lack access to social protection, protective healthcare equipment, even at this time, even with a year in on the pandemic. Laura, I see you, would you like to, you're raising your hand, would you like to speak out? Well, and yes, for sure. Um, so my name is Laura, I am from Venezuela. I am the founder and president of Girl of Venezuela and that's my experience with feminist movements. Um, to be honest, in countries, uh, there are a lot of countries, but uh, I'm going to talk about my experiences specifically in Venezuela and Latin America, where there is a lack of information and misinformation on what gender equality actually means and why it is important. And so this has led to girls being afraid of identifying themselves as feminists uh -huh. and joining feminist movements. Um, also negative comments and people trying to bring down our actions and efforts because they believe that we're just wasting our times and just making noise because we're bored. Um, and so that has been a huge problem because in order to bring action, you need awareness and you need people worried about the impact of not having gender equality. Um, and so that uh, is a huge issue, at least in Venezuela. And so it, it, it brings insecurity in girls and women when it comes to um, joining the feminist movements and, and, and identifying themselves in, uh, as, as leaders in gender equality, in advancing gender equality in their countries. Um, and so they're afraid because they might be called out as crazy or um, not people as well. So there are tons of girls who know a lot, who have potentials to be leader, who have potential to be leaders, use their social media to join movements, to actually uh, be part of a bigger movement, to advocate for the changes that are needed but are afraid to do so. And so I think everything starts with awareness and education, maybe start adding gender equality in educational systems. Um, you know, the governments and, and, and men leaders that already have power and visibility to start sharing their spotlight and start talking about gender equality and passing the microphone to minority groups and, and girls who are in the fight um, so they can be heard by those who don't want to listen. Um, so, yeah, thank you so Thanks, much. Laura, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing. I think RT. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks. So I represent one of the NGOs called Srimad Rajendra Love and Care in India. And I just wanted to make two comments. Means, you know, this is a very, very important conversation we are having. We know that women in any society are the backbone, right? The foundation of the families, whether it's Western or um, uh, uh, developing and non-developing countries. And women's sustainability becomes extremely important. The empowerment of women in sustainability, especially in rural parts, uh, poverty-stricken region, regions, Given COVID, a lot of uh, men, right, their hourly labor, they have lost the jobs. And how do we, what, what can we do uh, to support these women in rural parts of the world from a sustainability perspective is a very, very important issue that we should address. Thank you, RT. Absolutely, Joan. Hi, and thank you for, for having me. I'm Joan Washington. I am from Detroit, Michigan. 
I'm an international world traveler. I, I worked in Saudi Arabia and Yemen and uh, East Africa, West Africa, uh, all over the world uh, with the US government putting together microeconomic and education programs. Right now I'm with the American Human Rights Council and I really, really want to just talk about something that's very critical and very important as a black woman of color. Now, a lot of black women will be turned off by the word feminist, okay? Because as coming from a black family, coming from strong black women in my family, black women have always worked when white women couldn't get a job. Back in the day, we cleaned houses. We did those mundane jobs that white women would not do. So the feminine definition is a little different when it comes to black women. You know, but again, uh, the, the lady that was just finished talking, there needs to be a connection. I'm talking about from, from sister to sister here in America where we are. We need to be on the same page, speaking the same language, of, although our experience are a little different. Let's come together so we can get rid of those cobwebs. Let's come together so we can stop thinking about all this miscommunication about race and color and education. We have to look at those barriers. We have to have those hard talks about between uh, the difference between the cultures so we can come together in the important things when it comes to getting down to the brass tacks to solve these problems. Thank you. Thanks, Joan. And I think we're, you know, we're we're getting there. We are we're working it towards understanding better um, how intersectionality is core to feminist movements. Um, and I think we're we're moving in that direction, but there has always been historically major challenges around ensuring a truly intersectional feminist movement that is also transnational. So there's so many distinct experiences um, and many ways that we need to decenter, as you were saying, white women and Western women's experiences and center other experiences. I'm gonna let Leota uh, have the floor and then I see Sahar um, and others. Thank you for speaking out. Um, hello, um, I'm Leota. I'm a minor, so I can't have my camera on, otherwise I would for you all. Um, but I'm 18 and I'm working with the GSUSA delegation to CSW. And what I really wanted to highlight from the perspective of feminist issues is mental health um, and specifically having available, easy to access healthcare and mental health care resources for women and girls. Um, as a girl in my community, I know a lot of young women who really need some mental health care, but there are so many barriers in between getting to that care that their potential to do good and all of the wonderful goals and aspirations they have, they can't be achieved. And a lot of times if you have unaddressed mental health problems as a youth, they follow you your entire life and make it harder to achieve and thrive later in life. Um, so I think, it's, and especially for older women too, um, I know like, Elderly women can face a lot of isolation and a lot of similar mental health problems. And I think it's really important that we emphasize as part of the feminist movement, the importance of making sure that there is accessible and quality and tailored mental health care for these different groups and just in general. Thank you. Thanks, Leota. Excellent point. Sahar? Hello. Yes, thank you for inviting me into the circle. Um, I will just say that uh, what I really feel called to speak to is this idea of the narrative. Um, so I, I get really, I guess, really frustrated around the narrative of these poor people, you know, poor women. Uh, and it isn't to say that women are not struggling. It's just that the narrative is really problematic and gets internalized. So I, I would like to see a little bit more, again, empowerment was the center of the circle, was it not? So this idea of um, like self-realization, self-advancement, like projects that are autonomous uh, and are led by the people who are being served is something that I feel very passionate about. Yeah, I think that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thanks for sharing that. 
Yeah, that agency and autonomy, empowerment. Thanks for highlighting that. Um, Daisy. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to add to Joan's uh, remarks on, you know, feminist is a different definition for women of color. As a Latina indigenous woman in my community, a lot of women don't identify as feminist because they believe it is a fight for only white women. Um, for example, when it comes to the wage gap uh, discussion, white women make about 83 cents to a white male, but for a black woman, they make 54 cents. And for a uh, Latina indigenous woman, we make about 34 cents to that. And just talking about how the global pandemic has increased this wage gap and lack of promotions for women and women of color. And how can we all um, together as women who identify as women of color and non-women of color, how can we all fight this fight of kind of structural racism and what has been designed to keep us from reaching the next level and upward mobility? Um, thank you for letting me speak. Thanks, Daisy. Awesome points. Really great building on uh, some of the other comments. Doesn't empowerment imply that power is someone else's to be given to another? I, yes, empowerment is also a term that some people like and some people have critiqued. It's always hard to find the right terminology that everybody can agree on. Um, I'd love to give my hand, the hand and the mic over to Kristen, is it? Or Kirsten? Hi, yes, it's Kirsten. Um, I am also a minor, I'm 17 years old, so my camera is off, sorry about that. Um, I think I wanna go back to what Joan and Daisy are saying. Um, I'm also a woman of color. I am uh, of Asian and Hispanic descent. And um, I think one of the most uh, blatant issues regarding this uh, like feminism issue and how people of color may not feel as welcomed into the feminist, mo feminist movement is really, you know, an issue of starting at, at the very beginning where girls are uh, in uh, more underserved communities. And I think one of the issues is really the outreach. There needs to be more organizations to, uh, to get uh, young girls, especially girls of all diversities and uh, especially underserved communities to understand the importance of being involved in this movement so that they can really help every, uh, they can really help multiple communities move forward at once. And so it's not just uh, only the privileged or some communities that are moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Great, Kirsten. Really appreciate it. Everybody is coming in in the chat and, and supporting your, your comments. It's interesting, the feminist conversation, we also use these broader terminologies on women's leadership participation. Sometimes people then reflect, well, um, women in, in government, women's representation and participation doesn't always get feminist outcomes in terms of the challenge to power and patriarchy and privilege that comes um, with the feminist lens. Um, are people, do people prefer the broader women's participation, women's engagement, women's leadership uh, than the terms we chose for this conversation, which were, you know, feminist movements, feminist leadership? I think we have some hands up. I see a yes from Dawn. Do we have any hands up? Cynthia, please join us. Okay, all right. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Cynthia. I'm actually from Nigeria. I'm representing Gen Generation Initiative for Women and Youth Network. I'm from Nigeria. Okay, so I'm coming from an African perspective, okay? So whenever we talk about feminism or feminists, like people's mind tend to go to someone who is against men. Like that is how we view feminism here in Africa, in Nigeria to be precise. They see you as someone who is bitter, you're against men, you're against marriage, you're against children. Like they just see you as a bitter person and people uh, tend to um, shy away from you. People don't want to um, get in close contact with you. I think that's just like the main issue that we're facing here in Nigeria. They see feminism as a man hater. That's just it. That's what we see. And I think there's need, this calls for more uh, enlightenment, more education of what 
feminism is truly so that we can get more women to join this noble cause because it is truly one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. thanks for sharing that perspective. I see a lot of the chat uh, concept of gender justice. And of course, gender is uh, the, the broader spectrum and, and framework um, than a, a women's perspective. I really appreciate that the, the gender dynamics being placed at the center here and discussed and the concept of justice, right? The concept of uh, equity and fairness and outcomes that are, that are just. Um, gender fairism, I see uh, somebody putting into the chat. It, it's important that we have these conversations always, right? That around what terms we're using, how we're connecting. Somebody put in the chat how important it is we, we're working together um, as a transnational gender justice and feminist movement that we're supporting each other and able to understand each other's perspectives and working towards common aims in order to um, get the kind of change that we wanna see. Uh, what barriers, um, what other barriers are people experiencing um, or would like to highlight they don't obviously need to be only connected to COVID-19, um, cosmetic representation of women in leadership. Any other barriers people would like to talk about or challenges that we have? Language barriers, yes. And this is, this is only happening in English and in and of itself, this circle is very exclusionary to anybody who doesn't speak the English language. Um, obviously exclusionaries to many people um, who might be challenged in other ways. Adriana, over to you. Hi, um, I'm from the United States and I represent an NGO. And just from my experience and from where I am, usually women who are in leadership positions, a lot of the times their leadership styles get overlooked like they get more focused on, on what type of woman they are instead of what type of leader they are. Whereas you would never ask like men those specific questions or you would never question certain things about male leaders. Whereas if it's a woman leader, they get asked more about possibly like, I don't know, certain physical attributes, certain types of family. Whereas again, some men lead, men leaders wouldn't get asked those questions. And I think that is a big concern, which of, of uh, equality. Thank you for sharing that. Specific challenges that women face around leadership, how they're viewed and how their work is done, seen as done, can be a barrier to women wanting to participate um, and wanting to take leadership roles because of the kinds of expectations burdens that are placed upon them. I think we have another comment from Anna Perna, and then we're going to move the conversation circle to its next phase. Anna Perna, over to you. Okay, I, our hand is raised, but I'm not hearing Anna Perna. So thank you all for joining in the, the initial conversation on these, what the issues are we're discussing today. And I'm gonna hand it over to Ani uh, to continue the conversation and give you a prompt before we break out into breakout groups. Thank you, Shelly. I'm, I'm really um, you know, empowered, although <laughs> some, some um, of you don't agree don't like the word that much, but really empowered by the conversation. Before I share my screen and um, share the video with you, just a little context on the video. It's on uh, women and participation. Um, and um, it's um, discussing the recommendations um, in the framework of uh, the Beijing platform. As, as you might know, um, it was adopted in 1995 by 189 countries. Um, on the fourth um, UN conference. And um, what the role of uh, NGO CSW is, is to monitor uh, the implementation of um, 
um, of Beijing platform action. So uh, what we wanted to do is to share this video with you um, and it has some recommendations. Then we will move forward into smaller groups and, and discuss those recommendations and some of your um, reactions. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. All right. What I want to do, I want to go to the YouTube video. In many parts of the world, women's participation in governance has more than doubled since the Fourth World Conference on Women. Rwanda has the highest number of women in parliament, 61%. 143 out of 191 countries guarantee equal rights between men and women in their constitutions. Women are approximately half the global population, and yet, who has the power? In government, only 12 women worldwide are at the head. At work, only 6.6% of Fortune 500 company CEOs are women. So what are the positive gains of women in power and decision making? In Brazil, the formation of a women's parliamentary caucus led to the passing of an act penalizing domestic and family violence against women. In Zimbabwe, a new constitution which prioritizes women's rights resulted in women gaining 35% of parliamentary seats in the country's 2013 elections. Only 17% of women previously had those seats. Sustainable Development Goal 5, Target 5, is committed to ensuring women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in political, economic, and public life. Examine party structures and procedures to remove all barriers that discriminate against the participation of women. Take positive action to build a critical mass of women leaders, executives, and managers in strategic decision-making positions. Provide leadership and self-esteem training to assist women and girls, particularly those with special needs, women with disabilities, and women belonging to racial and ethnic minorities to strengthen their self-esteem and to encourage them to take decision-making positions. All right. All right. Here we go. So as you heard, there were um, some very general recommendations um, and it also refers to the Beijing platform. And as I said, CSW is there, its role is to monitor the, the progress and implementation of the actions um, um, agreed upon during the pla uh, Beijing platform. And what also CSW does, I forgot to mention, is um, monitor the progress and implementation of the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It's a very long name. The convention has um, a large name, it, it's CEDAW. So um, what we wanted to do is uh, just go over the three very general recommendations that the video had. And then Devon, we can break out to the, the smaller groups and have a smaller discussion on the recommendations. Uh, we, we suggest that you come into a conclusion on a couple of questions like, what are your takeaways from the recommendations? What challenges do you see and how you can overcome? And maybe if you have any personal experiences you wanted to share with the group. Um, anything I'm forgetting, Shelly, in terms of the questions? Those are good to go. Yeah, so in terms of recommendations, I think broadly, what do we need moving forward to do to strengthen women's um, feminist and gender equality, women's empowerment, feminist movements? So what do we need to do going forward? How do we use uh, the work of and the norms of the institutions and the frameworks that we have? What else do we need? And then your 
experiences with barriers and challenges, how we can overcome them and any personal experiences you wanna share as Ani said, just to note, you won't have a facilitator, you'll be um, empowered you all to have a conversation in your small group and manage it as a group. And we'd also like you to just decide amongst yourselves a rapporteur who can come back into the larger session at the end of your discussion and report back some of your key takeaways. Um, hope everybody can manage that kind of uh, self-governance, but I think it's a pretty uh, empowered group. And so do with your group and make the, the, the most of your group in a way that um, benefits you. I just, I'm not sure, Shelly, if you want me to go over the recommendations. It's three that are mentioned in the video and maybe the participants can, okay. Um, go for it, Anne. Got it. So first one, um, we have, I see a question from Deborah. We have 30 minutes um, and then we'll come back to the, to the group and share our um, takeaways. So we have 30 minutes in the smaller groups. Thank you for the question. Um, so the first recommendation it was to examine all party structures and procedures um, um, to overcome all barriers that discriminate against participation of women. The second was to take positive action to build a critical mass of women leaders, executives and managers in strategic decision-making positions. And the third was to provide leadership and self-esteem training to assist women and girls, particularly those with special needs, women with disabilities and women belonging to racial and ethnic minorities to strengthen their self-esteem and encourage them to take decision-making positions. So those are uh, the recommendations and Shelly went over um, uh, the questions that you can discuss. So Devon maybe can create the breakout rooms. I'm sure Devon is working on it. So we'll, we'll be in our small group. For a moment, any other questions you have about working in your groups in that broad framework? And thank you, Shannon. Yes, I, uh, may I, may I suggest something here? Yeah, absolutely, okay. please. Yeah, okay. Um, instead of all the same question uh, a small group have, uh, why don't we uh, uh, separate the groups by topics? As you, as any um, told the three, three points, right? Um, so that would be uh, more efficient to save time. We only have a 30 minutes, no less than 30 minutes, right? I um, actually, I was going to tell uh, my, my own perspective as a feminist. I, um, my context is Korea. As you know, Korea is known as very patriarchal society. We have a long traditions. I've been fighting against that kind of tradition so far. And I, I uh, spent my twenties and thirties mostly in the United States upstate New York and uh, Massachusetts for my study. And then I went back uh, to home after I finished my study. And people look at me as a feminist, especially Korean men look at me as a feminist. And they have some kind of a barrier, you know, toward me. So yes, it is true. I've been a leader in my school uh, over the 30, 30 some years as a professor of college. However, my life uh, as a professor has been a battle, you know, always uh, not on the surface, not on, on physically is fighting against the man, but mentally and spiritually, uh, I've been suffering, you know, because when I try to work with uh, my male partner, my co-workers at, at, at work, um, they're not really ready to talk with a woman open mind. Uh, although uh, we learned a long time ago, since a long time ago, we, we studied feminism and I became a feminist. However, in my real life, it's, it's a bit uh, ironic to be a real feminist, you know. All the time within myself, within my mentality, I have a one son. 
um, I ask myself always, I reflect myself, ask myself, are you a really truly feminist? Or sometimes you give up feminism, being a feminist. Rather, I have to live like a mother. My, my maternity is more expected by my family and my, at my school. So um, being a feminist in this era, now we confront with the COVID-19 pandemic. More mothers, I mean, mothers work more, more and more compared to before COVID-19. They have chores and they, even though they are feminists, you know, they have to think about themselves first. They have self-esteem and they have a self-concept, very firm self-concept inside of the feminists. However, in reality, in Asian women's con uh, living context, they go to kitchen first, you know, right after they finish, come, they work at, at work, come back home. The first things the, uh, the career woman should do, go, go, go into the kitchen area, take care of the dinner, you know, things like that. So all the Korean quarantine uh, policy made housewife more works, more diligently uh, faithful to their family works. Amira, even... thank... Okay, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I thought you were done. I'm sorry. I thank you so much for sharing that perspective. I know it resonated with everyone mm -hmm. here on so many levels. What is what is living a truly feminist life in the context yeah, of our social yeah, realities? Yeah. What does that mean? And how much do we put on ourselves, our ideas, our voices, our stories of ourselves, expectations um, and demands as feminists um, that make it hard for us to, to keep going sometimes? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. I do want to give everybody an opportunity to talk in small groups because I know there's so much out there people want to share. We're putting into the chat the questions. Um, we want to give you flexibility. You're not required to, to answer every single question. I think Mir has right. If you want to take one of the recommendations and um, that interests your group and talk through that, you're welcome, welcome to do that. Um, and so the only thing that we do ask is that you uh, designate one rapporteur to come on back and uh, give us the takeaways from your experience. It is an extremely hard and difficult time to be doing this work. Um, I wanna recognize that everybody here uh, is here to share in community and we all have um, stuff and issues to share and experience to share, reflections to share. Hmm. Any other comments before we go into groups? All right, the groups are ready, so I'll open them up. Thank you, Devon.